uh, our host, Robin Bauer Kilgo from uh, FAIC. Go ahead, Robin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Connecting to Collections Care webinar. Um, let me start by acknowledging that this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors, and I pay my respect to elders, both past and present. So I'm going to go through some introductory slides very quickly, and then we're going to go ahead and hand this over to our presenter. Uh, you are here today for the webinar Collections Intake in a Remote Work Environment. We'll be running from about 1 o'clock to 2.30-ish Eastern, so we hope you enjoy the program today. Again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo, and I am the CBC Care Coordinator. And you just saw Mike Morneau, our senior producer at Learning Times. We're here to help with any kind of tech issues you might have. So if you have any comments, feel free to put them in the chat. For anyone who hasn't done one of our programs before, um, I wanted to refer you to our website, connectingtocollections.org. On that website, you will find links to uh, all of the webinars, the archived webinars of our program. We've been doing CDC Care for onward to 10 years now, so there's quite a library of webinars found on there. You also see an archive of our courses um, and links to our curated resources, which I encourage you to go look at as well, and also our community. Um, the community is a moderated forum where you can go and ask collections care questions that we have some fabulous folks who volunteer for us who moderate it and make sure uh, you're getting good information. We're also currently looking for new monitors. So if you happen to be a conservator or a conservator in training and you are interested in becoming a monitor for the CDC care community, I encourage you to go to our website and there's some information on how you can sign up to do that on there. I did want to talk a couple quick notes about some upcoming webinars we have planned. Um, as many of you might know at FAIC, uh, they do a program every May called May Day Prep about how you can do small things around your community or your institution to prepare yourself for disasters and emergency. Well, as part of that program, we have two webinars planned for May. May 5th, we have tools for emergency planning. Um, you will be able to find out about some new tools that are being developed by AIC and the Northeast Document Conservation Center um, that can help you with emergency planning and disaster planning. Plus, we're going to talk generally about tools that people like to use for that subject. So I encourage you to sign up for that webinar. At the end of the month on May 31st, we're going to be talking about sustainability as disaster preparation. So for that topic, we're going to be talking to some folks who are dealing with emergencies and disaster planning and are trying to incorporate sustainability practices within what they do at their institutions. So again, encourage you to go register for both of those webinars. We're pretty soon going to have announcements on our June and July webinars as well. You can find out all about those on our website. We also have two places online that you can go to to find out other information or on social media, which are Facebook and Twitter. So I encourage you to follow those as well if you haven't already. As Mike said, we have two ways that you can communicate with our speaker and myself today. You have the chat box and the Q&A box. The chat box is there for people to say hello so we can see where they're at. Um, they can also tell us what the weather is like because people always like to do that. I'm currently still in Florida, so it continues to be hot, but I'm always encouraged to see what people talk about the weather around the country. The Q&A box is there for questions. So if you have a question for our presenter at any point, please put it in the Q&A box and we will try to get to it at the end of the presentation. Um, please direct the questions to the Q&A box. It makes it easier for us to track them throughout the actual presentation itself. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to our speaker, Sarah Kopolish. She is an instructor of the Northern States Conservation Center's Museum Classes Online and Registrar at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And today she's going to be talking to us about all the fabulous new ways we've learned how to do intake and processing in this still digital world we continue to live in. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Sarah and we will see you at the end during the Q&A. Sarah, feel free to go ahead. Thank you, Robin. I'm just going to switch over here to my presentation. All right, everybody. Um, welcome to Collections Intake in a Remote Work Environment. As Robin said, I'm Sarah Kapelish. I'm really excited to be here today just to talk to you a little bit about all of the things I've been going through at work as we are learning to work in this whole new reality. Um, pretty exciting and definitely a lot to think about 
Um, just getting started a little bit about me. I have been working in the museum field since around 2006. Um, I'm the registrar at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, which is a department of the Wisconsin Veterans Affairs. So I do in fact work for the government. I have been there for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years in June. And I've also been teaching for the Northern Conservation Center's online museum program for around eight years. I started in around 2015. And with them, I teach a class on databasing. We talk about found in collections. And then we also talk about legal issues in collection management. Those are one month classes that happen um, generally once a year. I've got a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in public history from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, and I've also worked in a couple other museums. I'm the History Museum at the Castle. I worked for the Kenosha Public Museums, um, one people may have heard of. I've worked for the Harley Davidson Museum. And my first stint was with the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center. Um, in my free time, I volunteered for the AASLH Nomenclature Task Force, and I helped on um, the edition Nomenclature 4.0. And I also served as the um, president of the Wisconsin Federation of, the, of Museums. Um, I'm not doing as much volunteer work these days, as you can see in this picture. This is me and my munchkin um, from a vacation in Hawaii this past spring. So I've stepped away from a lot of that. I'm just focusing on teaching in my normal day job right now. So without further ado, um, here's what we are going to be chatting about today, more or less in order. Um, first, we're gonna start off talking a little bit about shifting to remote work. Um, then we're gonna talk about working with collection donors, assessing collections for potential donation, paperwork and processes, and we'll wrap it up with some final thoughts and Q&A. Um, it's kind of interesting. So these are things that you wouldn't think we'd need to still talk about, but as we had shifted into this whole new work environment, a lot of things have changed just the way we do our everyday work. So I hope that what we can provide is at least helpful and get you thinking. And I'd also really love to hear what other people are doing. Um, like I said, we'll have plenty of time for questions, comments, concerns at the end. So please make sure to put those in the correct boxes. Also, if you want to go back to a slide, if there's something specific you want to cover, it may be helpful if you make mention of which slide you'd like us to return to later. Um, so before we get started, I was hoping Robin could run the first poll. I want to try to get some idea as to what everyone has been going through and shifting to a remote work environment. Or I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. We can take a look at those results. All right, great. So the question was, how did COVID-19 affect your work environment? I'm assuming for everybody that this was the main change that affected our work. So it looks like a majority of us, 57%, um, were sent home to work our normal duties. 13% um, had no change to my work duties or work location. That's great. Um, let's see, we've got 10%. I was sent home and assigned to projects outside my normal scope. Um, some people were displaced temporarily. We've got a couple people that um, stayed at work while many of their colleagues were reassigned or displaced and just a couple of people that were permanently displaced. So that's great. Um, that's really helpful for me to understand sort of where everyone is coming from. Let's switch back here. So, um, here you see the various iterations of my remote workspaces and my coworker, Booba the cat. 
Um, as you can probably tell, my journey started in the dining room um, at the table, and I slowly sort of moved to the couch in the kitchen, and eventually we ended up turning a toy room into an office. I was one of those naysayers. Every week I thought I was going to be going back to work, so it took me about a year, a little over a year, to get to the place where I actually had a set office space in my house. So the first few days for me, and this is you know my personal story, um, I remember exactly where I was when things started to close. So probably not the best move, but I was on my way to a water park with um, friends and family. I had taken a long weekend and we're driving in the car to get there. It's about an hour drive and we hear that the schools are closing. Like, oh, wow, okay, we're taking this really seriously. So we enjoyed our weekend at the water park and then that following Wednesday I went back to work. We had a staff meeting and for the very first time nobody was sitting next to each other at the table. So we weren't wearing masks yet, none of that had happened, but we're all kind of spaced out staring at each other and if somebody coughed we were suspicious. So this is the meeting where we were told, okay, we're going to gather our stuff and we're going to go work from home for two weeks. Okay, cool. Um, I have about an hour commute each way um, from my home in Wales, Wisconsin to Madison. So I grabbed my laptop. I already had a VPN or a virtual private network set up. I grabbed it. I skipped out the door as fast as I possibly could. Thought this is going to be great. Um, we were really lucky um, working for the government. We had an IT section that was dedicated to making sure we were up and running. Um, I got home and pretty quickly realized that on my super duper old laptop, um, the VPN was not working well. They moved to some new technology and what they did is they used Horizon so then we could very easily remote in. But we had a lot of challenges with just equipment and figuring out what to bring home. And we also had some problems with our databases. Um, for the collection, we had been using Past Perfect 5, which once we remoted in generally worked okay, but we were trying to figure out ways to be more efficient. Um, I also found myself sort of as the overseer of the collections database a couple months in, people were running out of stuff to do. So every week we're being told, oh, another week, another two weeks. And nobody really knew what was going on. So for us in Wisconsin, this started you know, mid-March. By about May, June, nobody had things to do. So I was all of a sudden getting calls from people, hey, do you have any projects we can work on? And things we were assigning people were people database cleanup. You know, we didn't have things like dates and biographical information. So we put a lot of people on those types of work and it ended up being great. Um, a lot of our staff, we were lucky with this too, um, working for the government, they decided really early on that they understood that our workers may now be supporting families and they did not want to let anybody go. So while it was optional for most of us, um, our staff did have some optional opportunities for short-term reassignment. A lot of people took on tasks for the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, some people worked for the Department of Workforce Development for a little while. I helped for a few months with the Election Commission, actually. And then come July, we were starting to be let in the office again, and things sort of slowly started going back to normal, normal-ish. Um, by July, July, August, we were allowed in the office maybe one or two days a week and we had to be spaced out. I work in a storage facility with just two other coworkers. So for us, it wasn't a huge deal, um, but our main museum facilities, we stayed closed like probably a lot of you did. And we really had to space out our time in the office and that continued for a really long time, which sort of led to you having to develop these workspaces and come up with your new normal. So tasks have been reassigned, people are doing all sorts of things they've never done before, but lucky for us, our database has never looked better. Um, in the resources section that I believe was posted online, there's an article from the American Alliance of Museums where they give some tips for remote work, and I thought some of these tips were really helpful. 
Um, I don't know how many of you are still working from home. Um, I think we asked that in a little while, but a couple of the key points that I found really helpful, maybe some of you might find these helpful as well. Um, the first tip they give is just to set aside a designated workspace. This is probably not your bed. In my instance, it was not the couch. And it took a while to figure it out. I worked all over the house, but eventually when we realized that we're going to be home for a while and I am still home, we needed, I needed a space that was really set aside for me. And it's still not perfect. Um, my husband works from home and I can still hear him and I've learned all about his business. I've sat here trying to do my own. Um, another tip that the Alliance gives us is to keep set hours like you would at work. A lot of people, I think, found it super easy working from home to put in way too many hours. And we don't need to do that. You end up working all day long because we always have stuff we can do. Don't do that. Keep track of it. Make sure you're working, you know, your eight or your eight and a half hours and then you're done. Um, and also, I think it's really important to take a lunch break. One of the ones that I giggled about, one of their tips, but I actually think it's pretty useful as well, was just to get dressed every day. I don't know about you, but how many of us have gone to work in our pajamas before? I've definitely done it once or twice. Um, they suggest that you be comfortable, but definitely get dressed for your day. A couple others that they give us, learn how to use your new tools like Zoom and Skype and Teams or whatever work is thrust upon you so that you're really comfortable using these new platforms. Um, they suggest doing some virtual check-ins with colleagues. I think this is really important so you don't lose touch with the other people in your office, but you also have to be considerate of people who may not be super comfortable or are struggling with Zoom fatigue. And there is an article about Zoom fatigue um, in the resources as well that you might find useful. It's a real thing. Some people are just not comfortable with it. So we need to learn new ways of communicating with our coworkers. And lastly, use the commute time saved for yourself. For me, this was almost two hours a day. I like to walk, I might take a class, I might take a nap at the end of my day, just do something for you. All right, so if we could do the second poll, Robin, please. What has collecting looked like over the last two years at your institution? All right, great, thanks everybody. Um, so kind of an interesting spread. Um, it looks like 39% halted during COVID-19 shutdowns then returned to normal intake rates. So you're collecting stat for a little bit and then you can turn, um, return to normal. Um, no change in intake rates was 28%. We've got 23% at halted during COVID-19 shutdowns then intake rate increased, that is me. Um, and then a few people said that they halted during COVID-19 shutdowns and intake never picked back up again. So thank you for that again. That just sort of helps me understand where everyone is coming from. So we're working from home. The donors have not stopped knocking on the door, right? And now we have to sort of figure out what to do with it. Um, so initially we shut down collecting. So from March to July, for sure, we did not take anything in. 
donors kept calling and we needed to eventually figure out a way to meet with them and to take in collections again. We had no idea when we were going back to the office. So this was something we really needed to figure out. And we had a lot of challenges with scheduling. I told you we had limited on-site time where staff were only allowed on-site maybe two days a week. And it was really important to keep um, all of our staff safe as well as the donors safe. Um, so we tried to figure out, okay, what can we do? And the collection committee met and we made some decisions. So one of the things we did was to shift to a single staff member who was gonna do all of our intake for us, at least initially. And it wasn't a staff member, you'd probably think it was. It was actually one of our archivists decided to take it on. So before COVID started, most of our collection committee, which is made up of our director, our assistant director, our collections folk, our curator folk, and a couple of archivists, anybody could take stuff in, but things predominantly came in through um, our curator and then our archivist. So what we decided was just to keep things straight, we would have one staff member handle all of the donor visits, all of the calls, all of everything. Everything that came in to any of our staff members went directly to this person. Um, and we had to sort of rethink things like, what do we do with the meeting? Um, a lot of donors still wanted to meet with us, to talk with us. They weren't as afraid of us as we were. So what we decided is we had to have scheduled planned meetings only. Um, in part, this was because we were closed, so people could not do drop-ins, but also because we wanted to make sure that this one person was available, that we had a large enough space available where people could keep their six feet of distance and still look at the collections. We added sign-in for contact tracing. Um, we had done sign-in before when people were entering a building to look at collections areas, but we opened that up to anybody who was coming in and meeting with staff. Um, we did a better job of communicating timeframes with donors. This was something we sort of had to switch our way of thinking. I had always returned collections, you know, about a month. We do a collection committee meeting once a month or so. I'd have answers to donors right away. And we had to do a really good job of communicating with them how long things were really taking us. We also did things like trying to limit what we took in for review. So before somebody showed up at the museum, we take a look at a large lot as long as it met our mission. Yes, it talks about a Wisconsin veteran, it tells a story. We would take it all in for review and we wouldn't worry about you know having them pick it up or send it back. But that was taking up a bunch of time. And again, we only had this one person working on it. So one of the things that we did was to try to do more review by email, at least initial reviews. So the person who was meeting with the donors or talking to the donors might have email conversations and phone call conversations first. And if he wasn't sure if we wanted to bring something in, then what he would do is he would get them to send us some pictures and we would review things that way. Um, we also had it to be, had to be more flexible with the way we did returns. So we still never took everything that came in, um, even when we were trying to be a little bit more um, selective with the collections that we were looking at. Uh, we turned from a donor pickup situation where we started shipping everything back. So now we ship everything back via FedEx. We don't really, we weren't letting donors come in to pick things up. We just shifted to like a no, non-essential on-site visit. So a donor may still come in to meet with um, meet with us to talk about their collection, to do the handoff. It's fine, one big space, but then after that, we would do things via FedEx. And while all of this going on, our agency is pushing us to move as many things to a virtual platform as we could, from programs to collections. Again, we shifted to more of an email phone call system with our donors. Um, we didn't have a choice, we were closed, trying to do a lot of things with pictures. Um, collection committee, we decided that things could be decided by email in certain instances. And overall, this has been really good for us, I think. It's improved our communication overall, both as the staff talking about collections, um, trying to decide what we wanted to take in, but also working with donors. It taught us to just be a little bit more 
open and upfront, um, we have an easier time saying no to things than we used to because I think we have a better understanding of how much work really goes into taking in collections and not just the initial meeting, but the entirety of the process, including returning things to donors, which costs us quite a bit of money in shipping and also takes a lot of time. So we're going to move on to talk about the actual um, process of assessing collections for donation to our museum. Um, for this one, we're going to do the third poll. All right, if you have collection committee meetings to review donor offers, what do those look like right now? Are you meeting in person? Are you meeting only virtually? Do you have some kind of hybrid based on scheduling other fact and other factors? Or do you not hold collection committee meetings? All right, great. It looks like a lot of you are doing, still doing virtual collection committee meetings only. That's great. I, I would love to hear about how everyone else does these. Um, uh, we've got some hybrid meetings. 29% are not holding collection committee meetings. I'd be curious to know if you held them before COVID, if this is a new process to not do them. And then we do have a few people 8% that are doing their collection committee meetings always in person. Okay, great. So a lot of us are doing at least some form of virtual meeting. So to kind of talk about how we have shifted from our old version of the collection committee meeting to the new one, um, I have to explain our general process. So before COVID hit, the way we took things into our museum is everything comes in for potential review on this temporary custody receipt form. That's what you're seeing in the picture. Any staff member and even the gift store could take things in on this form. We still use this form today. It's got the donor's name. It's got a number so that we can track it. It's got all of the contact information. It tells me what the donor wants us to do with the material. It gives us permission to accept it for donation, to review it, um, if somebody wants it back or if they want it disposed or transferred, we can do all of those things with this form. Now this form for us is a one year loan agreement is the way the technical language on the back reads. Um, what that does for us is that just starts a date. So if for some reason we can't get the material back to an owner, we've got a date to start abandoned property law. So that's how this form works, is that anything can come in on this form. So once we receive material and it's, on, it's all listed and inventoried on the form, we've got the signatures, the material would come to me and I would take the material, I would inventory it and I would enter it into our past perfect five database. That's what we used to use. I would generate from the database a very basic report that listed the story behind the pieces and the donation in general, if we knew it. And then um, what would happen is our staff would basically do a show and tell type meeting. We would all gather in a small little temporary storage room and we would one by one look at all the things. The goal would always be to look at things ahead of time, but often that didn't happen. And this led to kind of long meetings that were very drawn out. A lot of things we had to discuss after the fact because nobody was coming to the meetings really ready for decisions. But that was okay, that's the way we did stuff. Once everything would be approved, 
um, I would send out donation paperwork, our certificate of donation and a thank you letter. And then anything that we didn't want, we would call them to come and pick up, or if they were a distance, we might ship the material back to them. You know, those things that were declined. Now our collection committee is made up of nine people. So it's a pretty big group. Um, again, smooshing in a tiny little room to play show and tell. This was a bit challenging before COVID and it became impossible to do after. So we went from March to about July, um, not bringing anything in, not meeting, not having collection committee meetings. Then what we realized is ugh, we've been sitting on some material since February or March. We've been telling the donors, hey, I'm sorry, we can't go into the museum even to look at this stuff. Um, but they wanted answers and we needed to move the material along. By July, we were allowed in the office a couple days a week, um, spaced out, not with anybody else. But only virtual meetings were allowed with our agency. So we had to kind of quickly figure out the best way to get through at least this old batch of material that we needed to move on, right? So right here, what you're seeing is our very first version of the virtual collection committee meeting. That's a picture of me and my coworkers hadn't seen me for several months. So I was being silly, but what you got, um, we had to create instructions, that's the agenda. We asked everybody to review the items um, make some initial votes. I wanted people to really think about it because I'm trying to figure out the best way to hold the Zoom meeting. And we really wanted to only have to talk about the things where there were questions or we weren't sure. We didn't want to have to spend a whole bunch of time talking about every individual piece. So my solution to this was to create um, just a basic, this is a PDF document. I had some instructions on there. Um, we kind of treated it sort of similar to the way we had been doing the list before, but we added pictures. I also had comments from our collection manager. So she would look at this after I'd and be like, oh, we already have some or we don't. So we sort of could compare it to what might already be in the collection. I squeezed in this little chart where people could make their votes, make comments, make notes. And this was our very first collection committee. All in all, it worked pretty well. It took a lot of time to create. So I had to take the TR form and take in all the material. I had to copy and paste from different reports that people gave me, take all the pictures, um, do the data analysis to figure out what we still needed to talk about. And then I still had to do all of the accessioning and everything after the fact. But for the first meeting, this really worked quite well. By the end of summer 2020, we had started collecting again. We predominantly focused on those donors that did not want to wait anymore. We had been putting people off since spring and people were getting very anxious to give us their stuff. So we did start collecting and this is the second version of our virtual collection committee meeting. Um, it's not a lot different, but the big change that we did was to move the spreadsheet from the review list into a separate Excel spreadsheet. Um, the spreadsheet initially lived in a couple of different places. It lived in our network drive and then also in SharePoint. Um, our review list still had some notes from our collection manager, still had the pictures. Um, in general, this worked a little bit better for staff. Predominantly, I think it just gave them more room for notes. Um, but again, it was a lot of duplicate work for me. I had to create these and then also accession everything. And it became a little bit hard to track um, because I had one sheet with all these numbers and then I had a basic entry in our database. And then I also had all these spreadsheets that I had to reconcile. So it ended up being quite a bit of work. So after going through this process of prepping virtual collection committee meetings, I really tried to assess how things were working. Um, tried to come up with some challenges and areas where we might be able to improve the process and also talk about things that were working well. So some of the challenges I came across were just this duplication of work. I felt like I was doing the exact same thing three times because I had to create the Excel spreadsheet, I had to create the review list, I had to eventually put everything in the database when I accessioned it and created the basic catalog records. So the process just wasn't that efficient. 
Um, turnaround time took quite a while. Um, also, we noticed that when staff weren't like coming in to look at things, they were not getting a good assessment of the condition. And we found that staff just in general were not as invested in the collections when they didn't see them in person. And because I was trying to keep this as easy and efficient as possible, I was generally only taking maybe one picture of things just to give people an idea. And my thought was, well, you can still come and make an appointment and see the material if you want to, but that wasn't really happening. So they just didn't really know what they were looking at. We also found that when they did not see the piece that sort of spread out in this one little room, we were inclined to possibly take more than we otherwise would have. Um, both things that were maybe not in the best condition, but also duplicate items just because we couldn't visualize, our staff couldn't visualize how much we were taking in. So there were definitely some challenge with the new process. Um, some things that we did find were working though, um, in general, staff were much better prepared for meetings than they had ever been in the past. This is great. So again, even when we were in the same building before we moved to a separate storage facility um, with the collections, the expectation was that our staff on the committee would come down to the basement and look at everything before the meeting. They got the spreadsheet to review a week or two in advance, so everybody had plenty of time to come down and look at things or ask questions, but they never did that. Now that they had to fill out a spreadsheet and actually make notes and make a vote, I found that they were really looking at things. They also had a lot more time to really think about how we might use potential donations. Other good things that sort of came out of it, we had more time to ask follow-up questions of the donor or other family members if we had questions about something. Um, for example, recently we came across a flight suit and there was a patch that was associated with it, but it wasn't attached. I had plenty of time to go back to the donor and say, hey, what's the story on this? It's like, oh, that was my name pay and it went with it. So we had a lot of time to do that kind of follow-up, which I think has added a lot of value to our collection. Um, we also found that the virtual meetings have allowed us to have a lot more flexibility. Um, now we have moved to a hybrid work environment. So for the most part, as long as COVID is not raging, we are allowed to be in the office as much as we want to. Um, we do have to be in the office at least two days a week or 16 hours or so a week. So for me, I'm on site two days a week and I work from home the rest of the week. And a lot of people do a schedule like that. So it's very rare that we are all together. And being able to do these virtual meetings has allowed us to keep moving the collections along. So ultimately, we can be in the office together. We don't have to be, it's also better for the collection because we're not doing the show and tell. Um, I'm the only one touching the material. I know where everything is, stuff isn't getting moved around and it's just been much easier to work with. So we have decided, to, um, at least for now, keep this virtual meeting format. So since we decided, several months ago now that we wanted to keep the format. I'm still continuing to work on trying to improve the process, right? So I, some of the things that we've done to make the meetings run a little bit better um, is that I have more power over, over deciding what we're gonna do. Um, I get to decide how many items we can handle in a month or in a meeting how many items staff can get through. So one thing we found is virtual meetings are hard. Um, we can handle even a two hour meeting, but anything past that and people's eyes start to glaze over. So I've started to limit our collection committee meetings to about a hundred pieces. Um, I found that any more than that, and honestly, people sort of stop caring a little bit, especially if it's a lot of duplicative material. Insignia is hard to look at when there's, you know, 300 pieces. Um, one of the other things we did during this whole work from home phase was we converted from Path Perfect 5 to Path Perfect Web Edition. Um, which was really, really helpful for us because it allowed everyone to be able to work from home and access the database a little bit easier without having to be dependent on all of our networks. 
Um, so one of the things I really tried to figure out how to do was to best get everything in one place. So that's something that I've been working on continually. We've also had some space challenges. So I know some people said that their collecting got a boost. Our collecting has gone up almost 50%. Um, a lot of years we were taking in maybe 168 to 250 pieces. We are over 450 pieces um, for this fiscal year. So we still have a couple months left and that runs from July to the end of June. So we have seen a huge increase and we are sort of trying to figure out how to handle storage of all of these pieces because it still takes quite a bit of time to make the reports, do the review, um, and get things back to people and get the material out. So this is what we are using now for our collection committee meetings. Um, this has been in place for a little while, um, at least several months, I think. Um, and you can kind of see what we have. We get, there's a, an agenda. Um, and folks can add to it. I usually try to send this out a week or two, you know, about two weeks in advance. So people can add things to it that they need to. They can also review everything pretty quickly. And here's another look at just what you get for the review and then also the new staff spreadsheet. Um, using this format, we found that the biggest change is really um, just to try to encourage discussion. So we were finding a lot of people, they'd look through the material, they'd read the bios, and then what they would do is they would just mark discuss, but they wouldn't put any notes on it. So we started to enforce the notes idea. We've also tried to get people to understand that it is totally okay to abstain from voting on something, and that's okay. If you don't feel strongly about a piece, we don't have to talk about it. It's okay to just say no. Or if an objects person wants to abstain and defer to our archive staff about things that really pertain to their collection, I think that's totally fine. So those are some of the things we've struggled with just a little bit. So now what I have done is I use the PassPerfect web edition database to do everything. Um, our current review list includes a bio that you see right kind of at the top. There's a temporary catalog ID number that I use for tracking everything and that goes back to the temporary custody form. There's an object name, a title, a description. I add condition notes and I do add photographs and that goes right into the database so that when I create these reports, it comes right out and goes with it. It also makes it easier to add multiple pictures um, with this all originating from our collection management system. It just goes much faster. Um, the spreadsheet I can do from that system as well. It may not be exactly ideal, but it has been much faster. So fully track the donation from receipt to return or accessioning without having to do any additional or duplicative work. Um, and the basic cataloging information is already here. We have also added some quicker, faster ways to review and approve certain lots using Google Sheets. So what happened was several months ago now, we realized that there are certain collections that we pretty much always say yes to. Um, and we needed ways to try to keep up with our hugely increased intake. So one of the things I decided to try is we had always allowed for voting by email. So I'm like, okay, but people need the information. What's the best way to do that and gather the votes and keep track of everything? So we just wanted a fast way to review certain types of collections by email. And I decided to use Google Sheets. Found it, it's not quite as efficient, but it does allow people to easily and quickly vote. In general, my staff actually prefers the Google Sheets to any of the other formats. It just doesn't work as well for me. So this is what our email vote using Google Sheets look like. I try to limit this to about 10 items or archival lots. 
you get almost the same information as the review sheet, except rather than having to vote and make notes, you just have to answer a question. So you read through the bio, you see the description of the collection, and then whoever is in charge of that collection, what they do is they make some recommendations. So my staff basically just votes, yes, we agree to the recommendation. No, we don't. We'd like to discuss it further in a future collection committee meeting, or I abstain and acknowledge that my silence will be taken as consensus. So if somebody says, I would like to discuss it further, what we'll do is we'll pull it out and I will add it to a collection committee. Um, I also really like that for each of the questions it asks, I just get my results right away. So I don't have to count anything up and it just quickly shows me, yep, everybody wanted this and I will prepare the certificate of donation paperwork. So we don't use this for everything. It's a lot of copying and pasting. Since the material and the content is already in the database, it's relatively quick to create this, but it still takes more time than just downloading the spreadsheets and the review lists from the database. So we use this for things like archival apps, which we know meet our mission and we generally always accept um, dog tags as part of our collection policy. We always accept at least one dog tag and then things like engraved purple heart metals. So now that you've seen how we are reviewing collections virtually, we can chat just a little bit about the paperwork and process that has gone into this. Um, when reviewing our collections intake paperwork and processes, we had some main points we really wanted to consider. Um, so first was the organizational desire to move everything to virtual. Um, we were thinking about the technical limitations associated with the hybrid schedules. Just for example, I do not at home have access to a printer um, and also mailing supplies for our donation paperwork. We're looking for improved process efficiency and consistency in our data entry and our paperwork standards. Um, we were thinking about changing donor expectations and then new types of collections such as donations of digital material. So this was kind of interesting. While all of these things were happening in the background, we also started to see an influx of digital collections, things coming in on thumb drives or CDs or even just emailed photographs. So we decided a while ago to catalog born digital collections just like any other collections that we would take in. And we have already worked through sort of the storage and space issues with like holding that material. But we also, as we're reviewing things, wanted to make sure that our paperwork was all in line with everything we needed to make sure that we owned and could use this type of material. So one of the first things I did was try to figure out how to make the process of the paperwork as efficient as possible. So we switched over to Passport Web Edition. I'm like, mm, what can I do? So I moved all of my donation and loan paperwork into Pass perfect. It was easy for me. It was better to have just one place for everything. Um, it allows you to code the documents so that they autofill things like donor information and the collections and the addresses, phone numbers, all that just autofills now. Um, and with Pass Perfect Web Edition, we can work from anywhere where there is Wi Fi. So, what I found is I was able to do a lot of my paperwork off-site or just in storage, I could take pictures with my iPad and also send out paperwork right from there. It was really easy to prepare an email or print paperwork directly from the database using the existing data that was already in there anyway. So this pic shows the setup page in Path Perfect Web Edition for our certificate of donation. It took several days to get everything set up and loaded, but now it works really, really fast. Um, same thing with our thank you letter. We were able to code this and you can kind of see the coding in here so that it autofills. Um, my agency really wanted kind of a form letter for all of these things. So this has worked out really well for us. Um, and I can still again prepare all the paperwork from Past Perfect. It gave me a chance to really review everything. And we're now able to offer donors more ways to sign. So now they can sign by mail or email, and it's really made things easy. Um, so now we've got all this paperwork, we can send things by email, everything's really easy now. So now we're like, okay, well, 
we want the donors to potentially be able to sign electronically if they want to, right? We've opened up all of our platforms, everything's virtual. So our outreach is now connecting us to people all over the country um, and even internationally. So we need really good ways to work with them. So how can we now move into signing electronically? So I have been thinking about shifting to digital signatures or at least making that an option for our collection donors for quite a while. I was just hoping that if we could do something like that, it would improve my paperwork turnaround time. Um, it wasn't that unusual for it to take three months in multiple attempts to get people to send back signed certificate of donation paperwork. Now, not everybody, but there was always a handful of people that it would take forever. And sometimes it would be a year and I'd have to send it back per the requirements of our temporary custody receipt form. And it was only then that they're like, oh, you, I need to sign paper. I'm like, yes, yes, you do. So I'm trying to think of ways to make this easy to connect with those donors. So working with our legal section, we were able to add just some text to our standard certificate of donation form so that we could start to accept these electronic signatures if we wanted to. So the language we added is highlighted, but it basically just says, um, consistent with Wisconsin statute, I agree and understand that if I elect to sign this form electronically, my electronic signature is the legal equivalent of my manual or handwritten signature, has the same legal validity and enforceability as my manual handwritten signature, and I consent to be legally bound to this agreement. Further, if I elect to sign this form electronically, I affirm that my electronic signature was signed by myself with full knowledge and consent, and I am legally bound to these terms and conditions. I work for the government, so this is a mouthful. Um, if you work for the government, you may want to check and see what kind of statutes you have regarding electronic signatures. If you don't, you can probably work with a member of your board to come up with something a little more basic than this, just to make sure that you're covered. So in general, this has worked really, really well for us. Um, in reviewing our documentation and rewriting our certificate of donation form, we were able to make sure we were covering all types of collections and meeting our donor needs, coverage for digital collections where we may not be the only user. Um, most of our language covered that anyway. A lot of that was just staff training. This has also allowed us to work with sort of a new generation of more tech savvy donors they're used to doing things. A lot of people are used to doing things virtually. So this just was in flow with what a lot of people were already doing anyway. And it also created an option for increased speed of getting paperwork returned and closing out temporary receipts so that we could keep the intake process moving along. With so much coming in, it was really important to me that we kind of kept moving. Um, just some things to keep in mind with electronic signatures though, it is not for everyone. I had a great conversation with a coworker yesterday and she is adamantly against virtual signatures because she worked for a different agency and she found that the tech support she had to provide to make people understand how to do a virtual signature was really, really difficult. That's why I say this is probably not for all of your donors. This is probably for a handful of donors right now. But what I like to do is I send out the mail form first. And if I don't get that back, or if I have email contact information on the form, I try to send an email version that they can sign electronically back as my second option, unless they've already gave me permission to do it and then it works great. But oftentimes when I'm able to send out a form that they can sign virtually, I may get it back within a day or two where otherwise it takes at least two weeks, but oftentimes it's more than a month, which is a long time to kind of keep track and sit on other people's material. So um, pretty quick, we're gonna open it up for just some questions. And I'd also be interested in hearing comments or if anybody wants to share some of the things they've been doing. Thought it was really cool that a lot of you are doing sort of these virtual collection committee meetings. Um, but what I will say is something I've learned is that we've really learned a lot and have gone through a lot just these past few years. Things have changed an awful lot. Um, our director has this great saying. Um, he likes to say, embrace the suck. I always roll my eyes when he says embrace the suck, but I think that's what a lot of us did. And we made some really good progress. Um, for example, work flexibility, 
like we've never seen before. It's fantastic. With my little one, I probably would have had to quit my job by now if I wasn't able to work from home at least a little bit. So being able to see that, it's amazing. And I don't know about you guys, but when I work from home, I get so much done. Um, our database is also in the best shape it's ever been. We were able to spend almost a good solid year just doing database cleanup, something we would have never, ever had time for. So that's been great. Um, work is now more efficient. We've really had to think through a lot of ways that we did stuff. And we're in a field where we've been doing things the same way for, I mean, quite a long time. So rethinking all of those processes, I think has been really good for us. And we're also now able to provide good, different, better customer service to all of our donors through these new ways of working them, the new forms and the tech. I'm gonna turn it over to Robin and we can go over some questions. Sure can. And actually while we're doing that, um, I just put links in the chat for um, how to get the copy of this presentation and the resources that Sarah put together and also a, our survey link. I like to throw that up there at some point as well, just so people know, you know, they can do a, answer some survey about C2C care, which is always appreciated. Um, okay, well, to start with questions and I wanna say thank you for it was really interesting hearing you talk about, and I was thinking about how, just what you said about how, you know, like we saw this change in the field. And I know when I came into the field around the same time you did, like in 05, that was right when um, digital programs like Past Perfect and these content management or collections management systems were, were taking. But I still, a lot of places I worked at, still had the paper registers. Like it was, we were, we were seeing that transition from like paper to a digital asset management system for all these things. And I keep thinking now that, you know, as time goes on, we're going to be like, this is the other big shift, right? That happened in right. all the world. Like, this is going to be another big, like, wow. <laughs> like that yeah. really changed things. Sure. I think that's a great class. point. Even in the database class I've been teaching, when I first started teaching it, people were still trying to figure out what database they wanted to use. Like people knew they needed one, but were still sort of shifting into one. Maybe they were using Excel or something like that before. And now what I'm seeing is they're in a database and they don't like it. They want to do one. <laughs> Yeah, and like, and just all the, like, and I know it's, it's been interesting and this is off subject a little bit, but watching <laughs> people go from like databases and like I, when I started, it was really custom databases, right? Like everyone had their own little custom databases yep. and then you saw this <laughs> shift into, no, by the big databases. So that's when you saw like the past perfect, the embarks, the, you know, like the big guys. And now you're seeing people go, oh, sometimes the custom's better. Now they're all web-based, which was a really crazy thing for a while too. So it is like really I feel like a lot of our world now has sped up with these big shifts and how we do things lately. And it's just been, I, I'm at the point, again, we're around the same time period that like you've been in this field for 15, 16 years and you're kind of like, wow, <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like changing right now. So it's, it's very interesting. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start hitting some of these questions. You guys have been great about putting them in the Q&A box. So I do appreciate it. Um, someone asked when it came to the shipping, like when you were talking about shipping things back and forth to donors, do you have a shipping budget um, enough or what has been your shipping budget to be able to support the return of unselected artifacts to donors? Is that something you had to add to your budget? Did you already have it sitting here? Like what was your experience with that? Sure. So um, I'm fortunate again, because I work for the government, I actually do have a pretty significant collection budget that I oversee. Um, it's a shared budget amongst um, me, our collection manager and a couple of archivists, but it, it's big enough to cover this. I usually end up spending maybe a couple hundred dollars a year on FedEx shipping. Um, it used to be less because we would have more people that would come pick up their material and I would sit on it for longer. It wasn't a big deal, but yeah, I've had to definitely pay attention to that line in my budget. But for us, it has not been significant again because I'm very lucky to have a budget. But yeah, it's probably been, I'd say you have to set aside to maybe $300 a year, but I'm also shipping an awful lot back. Gotcha, that's useful for everyone. Um, another question I had, cause I, you know, it was interesting when you did that first poll that popped up about how um, some folks didn't have collections committees. Can you talk a little bit about who makes up the collections committee at your institution for those folks, just so they kind of know what the makeup is? Sure. So our collection committee um, has been part of our collection policy since we started. It's chaired by the registrar. So that's me. 
Um, and then our director and our assistant director are both on it. We've got a curator of history and a curator of exhibits. We're both on it. And then we have our oral historian, our processing archivist, our reference archivist, and our collection manager. So it is almost the entirety of the full-time staff. It's not quite everybody, but it's really close. Um, also, the way we are set up by statute, ultimately our director gets all of the authority to decide what comes in and what doesn't, but luckily we have this committee to at least sort of guide those directions, and while it's not a democracy, it often runs that way. Yeah, and I would just say from my experience, like I've worked at places where it was the registrar and the collections people who made that decision, and I've also worked with ones who are with committees. The thing I do like about committees is Sometimes you, if you work with organizations that only have a few people making those decisions, their personal likes can start creeping into your collection makeup. So sometimes having more people have a say can give you a wider view of what's happening within the acquisitions of your Yeah, company. it definitely helps in the discussions. And it also helps just to have our content. People really know what's coming in. Otherwise it comes in and nobody ever sees it again because nobody knows what's there. Exactly, exactly. Um, someone was asking, could we talk a little bit more about what Pass Perfect is? Is it a DAM, a digital asset management system? And can you speak a little bit about the difference between collections management systems and DAMs? Oh, I always use those terms interchangeably. I do. It's probably I do too. correct, maybe. I think, I think archivists <laughs> would be very upset with us with what the difference is between well, those two. Yeah, that's probably true. So um, at our museum, our archivists were sort of forced into using <laughs> That's Perfect. Um, they had been using something called InMagic for a long time. And what we sort of internally decided was that we needed to do a better job of linking collections across all of our sections. So we might have a photograph of a veteran wearing a hat and we might have the hat and we might have the oral history with the guy talking about wearing the hat. But up until we were in the same database, none of that information linked. So you'd never be able to find it unless somebody who had been there 20 years remembered. So we sort of forced everybody to go into, I think it's, this is the collection management system <laughs> is the correct use of um, the term for past perfect. And it's been great. It does have some searching limitations, but it allows us to accession everything. We track all of our loans through past perfect. Um, we have a past perfect online portal where the public can see our collections. I think I included that in the link for the resources too. If anybody just wanted to take a look at that, it's been a useful tool that took a little while to get up and running, but um, the public seemed to like it. And then we manage all of our object collection, all of our archives, our oral historian is in there too. Now, oral history and archives, they also send their information out to other link serves and things like that where the object collection sort of stays in the one database. I think that's one of like the differences in the profession, but we all do use it. I don't know if that helps to answer the question. <laughs> I mean, that's what I would say. It, to me, Past Perfect is more of a collection management system. Yeah, it's more really more like, a collection it's cool. tool that has tried to be useful to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's got, the biggest thing I hear from our archivists is that it's got too many fields. Yeah. Because they're trying to be a one-stop shop for, for all different types of collections. So yeah. at least that's been my experience with it. Yeah. So that's, it's more of a holistic view of your collections. Well, digital asset management is really more focused in the, correct me audience if I'm wrong, but it's more <laughs> focused on like archival side of the house and like actually managing di di pieces of digital. Yeah. Yeah. Out there. That's my very basic registrar understanding of the two when I look at them. Uh, someone asked, how many folks you know, or can you estimate, still use a paper accession book to record and track assignment of accession numbers and maintaining paper records? Do you guys maintain any kind of, so you all do? Okay, can you talk a little bit about that? So uh, when I started at the Veterans Museum, they had actually moved away from the paper um, ledger, and I moved us back. Because what I found, um, we ended up with a bunch of different spreadsheets and numbers were consistent and it was a little bit of a jumbled mess. And I also just in the back of my mind still worry about the database crashing, something crashing and losing the data. So I do still use the paper accession record. Um, our agency also wants us to have paper copies of everything. So we would keep paper copies regardless, but 
I still keep the donation paperwork and just the basic information about the donation in a hard copy file and put it in the drawer just in case. I will probably never need it. I don't use it for anything, but it does help me just to keep track of numbers. I think a lot of museums do still use the ledger. I'd be curious to hear what other people are doing. Uh, someone in the chat says they're using paper ledgers and accession records. And what we did at the last uh, full-time museum job I had, which was a while ago now, we started with, we would have past perfect, but then we would print out copies and then on acid-free paper and then put them in like the fire, you know, yeah. box basically with the accession paperwork. So we didn't use ledgers, but we had a paper record of everything kind of set yeah. somewhere to be on the backside. So yeah, someone saying our accession yeah. log is created in Excel and then printed and put in a binder. I've heard people doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's hard. You know, I, I look at the, the medical field sometimes, how they have gone completely digital. I don't think we're there yet. I think most of us still want that paper record, especially because I, I live in Hurricane Alley. So I'm always nervous that like, again, our stuff's going to get blown out and we still need those paper records out there. Um, someone says ledger and word. Yeah. So yeah. For me, I, it, yeah. for me, it's just helped to like actually see it and write it in the book though. Yeah. I Honestly, I barely need it and everything is backed up now. Um, Past Perfect backs everything up internally. So I'm not I'm not really that worried about losing it anymore. I could see us switching back in the future, but like I said, our staff has just never been great about consistently keeping all of these things running. So just having something written down in paper where you know if somebody's come in and crossed it out has been really helpful. Yeah, I can totally see that. Um, there was some discussion in the Q&A, which I'm summing up a couple of questions about people talking about just the meetings and how we have we used to have in person and they've been suspended. And so what do you think the future is for your guys' meetings? You guys are still virtual meetings, correct? Or Yeah, um, our director has said, and I tend to agree, I think we're probably going to stick with the virtual meetings, at least um, as far as I can see into the future. When we were all allowed back in the office, we kind of tentatively switched back to more of a hybrid where we viewed everything virtually, but we were in the room together. And there's just not any real need for it. And I think it's better for the collections to not have people touching them and moving them around. It makes it easier for me to track. I don't have the storage space for the amount of material that I'm taking in. So it's much easier for me to like keep it stored in boxes where it's safe and just in general, unless we get to a place where we're not taking in very much at all and it's not worth my time to do these sheets. I think we're gonna stay virtual at least for quite a while. How often do you guys meet just out of curiosity? It's been sporadic with COVID. We had been meeting once a month, once every six weeks. Um, I've been having problems scheduling meetings like with nine people. It's very yeah. difficult. And our meetings have been about two hours long, even the virtual meeting. So it's been challenging. Um, probably on average every six to eight weeks. So we are right now starting to shift to an every four week format just to try to get through the backlog of material we're reviewing. Excellent. Um, let me see what else we have in here. Someone's asking if you could possibly share your temporary custody receipt template. Um, rather than a direct question like that, do we know of any places where people can get examples of stuff? I know if you're a certain member of AAM, there's usually some sample forms. Um, Try to think of where else. I know in some of the MRM books, they have sample forms in the back, which are quite useful. Can you think of any other places where people can get sample forms from? Yeah, I would probably direct them to AAM. Um, if anybody really desperately wants to see mine, I work for the government, so it is all open record. I have no problem sharing. Um, there's a lot of language on the back of the form. Um, Google me and shoot me an email and I'd be happy to share it. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, AAM is great for those resources, I think. Or yeah, I think it used to be good to be a certain level to access their library. That could be. That's still true, but I could be wrong. Oh, someone said Googling. Oh, that's a good idea. Googling temporary custody receipt brings up a lot of examples. Thank you for <laughs> there you that. go. <laughs> the power of Google. Um, it's interesting when you were also talking about the intake rate, because I mean, one of the things I was thinking of was, you know, it. What, I know I did it and I'm still doing it, but like at the beginning of shutdown, I was like, time to clean out the house. You know what I mean? And just seeing the kind of stuff that we pulled out. Now, most of my stuff did not go to museums because I know better than to send <laughs> some of my stuff to museums. But have you seen that intake rate 
continuing or is it slowed down or what's been your experience with the intake rate so far? In general, it has been continuing at an uptick. Um, we're not entirely sure what's going on. We just did a 60 day check in because this has been a constant conversation for our team. Um, we are spending so much time working on collections and take that other things are starting to fall behind where back in the day when we had time, we weren't taking that much. A lot of people started to do other things. We wrote journal articles. We did more research, things like that. All of a sudden, all of those people are now focused back on cataloging and that's all we have time to do. So it's definitely continued. Um, we maybe saw just a little bit of a glimmer of hope like over Christmas, but then it, the intake rate shot right back up. So we do not see an end in sight as of right now. I'm sure at some point it will slow back down, but we're not sure when. Yeah, it's super. It is, like I said, it's interesting to kind of see, like, I know, well, I'm personally, I'm cleaning out some stuff for personal reasons, but it's, I, you know, I think a lot of that happened. And I also think, you know, and I experienced this as well. We had family members who passed away and we ended up with a lot of their stuff. And it's, I also live in Florida, which is like, I call the grandma's attic of this nation. So we end up with all sorts of crazy stuff from all across the country um, that you that you just end up with. And a lot of people still think museums are the places where everything needs to go. And we have mm -hmm. to be the ones who have to say, not always, <laughs> it just kind of depends on the item. So I think that's interesting to bring up. Someone is asking, um, does anyone else, so are you part, are you guys part of a series of museums? And you, you said you're part of a government. Are there other ones within the state organization that use Past Perfect or are you guys the only ones or how does that work for you all? Um, so for us, um, for the state of Wisconsin, there are two main museum cultural institutions that are under the branch of the government. So it's us, which is part of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and then the Wisconsin State Historical Society is their own government agency. Um, they use, I believe they use a web-based version of Argus. Um, and then they have a bunch of small museums that are like under their umbrella where they get some government assistance and some protection, but it's through the historical society and not directly through the state. Um, for example, I believe Circus World Museum is one of those and they do, at least they were using Past Perfect. Um, we have a lot of small museums throughout our state, though I will say they use it. Um, the State Historical Society through grants and training has done a lot to kind of support that program. And it's, it, it's inexpensive and we can use it for anything. So it's been a little bit of a push around here to get people to digitize the collections and to track things this way. And Past Perfect has gotten a lot of attention from us that way. Okay, thank you. Um, someone put that in there that thank you so much for doing on this. They were like, it, this is a topic that we've all kind of like been thinking about. And that was kind of needed to talk on. So thank you for doing the presentation today. Uh, going back to the paper records, it is someone put just put in the chat that my institution is over 60 years old. In the distant past, there was at least one database that became defunct and lost. I've experienced those. Um, I have a copy of the paper printout from that database. Our paper records have been invaluable. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. you experienced that with databases that people can't access anymore? Because I know I have dealt with that. Um, I have done just a little bit of training um, on Past Perfect, and a lot of the people that have switched over had said things like this, where they have lost data. I have not experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. um, before I started at the Veterans Museum, though, they had been using a program called SNAP. And I, th I don't, I think that's defunct now. I haven't ever seen it, never heard anything else about it. But when they moved the data from SNAP into Past Perfect, the way the information imported, they used Excel and Excel cut off a bunch of content. So there were fields where complete bits of information were lost. So having those paper records to go back to were really helpful. And that institution is just interesting because it's like they were ahead of the game and they really tried to back away from all of these paper records and all of these things, but they really needed them. <laughs> Yeah, I've had that too, where it's people, it was um, a couple old custom, either MS Access or ones where computers, like I, I've lived, worked at a couple places where we've kept like one computer alive, like this mm -hmm. one version of this old computer that they were like, that has the old database on it, never shut it off. Or oh yeah. Or <laughs> like it'll go away. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because then those paper records are like, because you know, at some point you're going to get that power surge where that thing goes up in smoke and then you're going to be like, I can't access it anymore. So sadly. Right.
And I think those of us in the field, like we are very aware of like possible disasters. So we've just got it ingrained in us, at least our generation that we, we need to have those duplicative copies. Yes, duplicate copies are always your friend. Okay, it looks like we've caught up with all the questions in the q and I'm gonna give it just another minute or so for people to ask any more if they want to. Uh, someone else in the chat says, I've experienced that too, data cut off. Yeah, it's, there used to be a session at AM. Um, they might still do it, but it would you would tell horror stories basically of Fun. Know, <laughs> different collections issues. And you would hear data cut off. You'd hear, you know, obviously the multiple numbering, you'd hear all this kind of crazy stuff, but I think, I think we're still going to experience that. And I think having the paper records around are still good. You know what I mean? Because you can get that information from them for sure. Well, I'm going to slowly start wrapping up things. Do you have any final thoughts for um, what you are presenting today or anything you'd like to tell the audience? Um, just that I would like to say thanks for listening. This was very therapeutic for me to kind of go over what I've been experiencing every day for the last couple of years. So this was great. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna, for you for the last time, I'm gonna put the links to our presentation resources and survey in the chat. Um, thank you again, Sarah. Thank you again, IMLS and FAIC for supporting this program. Thank you our folks at Learning Times for providing technical support. And I hope to see you all next week for our first in our May Day prep series. Again, we're doing one at the beginning of the month, one at the end. So feel free to join us for those webinars. I hope you all stay safe and thanks again, Sarah. And we'll talk to you guys soon, thanks. Thank you.